This is Dan Schneider. On this Dan Schneider video interview, I'm starting another of my trilogy of uh, shows on the big questions of existence and the cosmos. This is the first in a series on time. Dr. Tony Short, a physicist, is my guest this time, and we will begin the conversation in a moment. The subject is time. Tony Short, a physicist, is my guest. We will be talking about the nature of time, how it relates to cosmos and other things within existence. But as I usually like to do, I'd like to give him a few minutes to talk about who he is, where he comes from, his interest in physics and time. So welcome, Tony. And if you could give a little bit of background about yourself. Hi. So I'm, I'm Tony Short. So I'm an uh, academic at the University of Bristol. Um, I'm a senior lecturer here. I work on quantum physics. Um, quantum foundations and quantum information. So um, I'm really interested in the deep fundamental aspects of quantum theory and the physics in general. And in particular, I'm also interested in um, quantum information theory, which is partly about harnessing the fundamental aspects of quantum physics to do interesting computation and communication um, tasks. But it's also been very helpful in understanding the theory much more deeply. So that um, I'm most interested in the, in the fundamental parts rather than the applied side of things. Um, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I've always been interested in physics. I'm, I'm deeply driven by trying to understand how the universe works, and um, and obviously trying to understand time is is part of that. Um, so it's something I've been thinking about. Uh, well, you know, while I've been working on physics in general, and I have some thoughts about um, how it works and some understanding of how physicists see time. Um, but I've also recently been uh, fortunate enough to be funded by the Foundation of Questions Institute to think a bit about time specifically and have a research grant on that. Um, uh, I don't know, what, what else would you like to know? Uh, well, let's just start with time. Uh, someone once rather glibly, and I think that quote has been a attributed to a handful of people, so it may be apocryphal, but uh, the quote uh, that someone once said went rather glibly, and uh, it was that a time is the thing that prevents everything from happening at once. Uh, do we have a better definition of time in a uh, physical quantum sense than uh, just that so i think i mean how um really how to understand time in the context of quantum theory i think is still slightly open i mean the, there is a very so i think how most people understand time uh, maybe i'm wrong but my impression and certainly uh, the understanding that i came into things with was that you know you, you could describe the state of the universe at some time and then that state would change over time, would evolve in time and, and change. Uh, and the, the thing that governed that change was physical laws. So um, I would say that's the kind of uh, traditional view of, of time evolution in physics. But actually, after Einstein's relativity, a lot uh, the, the mainstream view sort of changed a lot. And now we think of space and time as interconnected. And um, certainly a lot of theoretical physicists would say that uh, we should think of space-time this sort of composite thing as a big, essentially a big box where all the events that could happen in the, the past, the future, and the present all existing in this box. So yeah. this box contains the whole history of the universe. And that, that's uh, referred to as the block universe. Box. Yeah, that, that's referred to usually as the block universe, correct? Yeah, the block universe, exactly. So, I mean, contrasting here, sort of an evolving state picture with a block universe picture. And notice in the block universe, there's actually no change. The thing is a static object yeah. that just contains all of the past, present, and the future. Um, so there's no special privileged status of the, the present in that, really. All times are equally kind of real. Well, then doesn't uh, that... Which is a strange thing to get your head around. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, but something like that would then obviate the idea of free will. Uh, consciousness would then be, I guess, sort of an illusion. And this, this would, I guess... I guess someone who's believing in an all-knowing, all-powerful God, though this would fit into their cosmological view. No, I mean, I guess you could. I mean, I guess I actually don't see. There's sort of similar answers to these issues on both sides of my picture. So, if in both these pictures that I have, there's no real room for free will, and then it's. I mean, it'll be something it'd be interesting to talk about. I don't really think it's easy to define what free will would mean in the sense that it could be true. I mean, I, I'm quite happy that I don't have free will. Um, but if we can talk about that later, but in one case, I think about a universe evolving by deterministic physical law. So the, the future is determined by the present. So there's still some sense, no room for free will there. And in the other sense, it's obviously all there already in the box. So it's, um, yeah. it's not there either. So I think they have similar views on that. 
um, I, I don't want to comment. To, I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm an atheist, so I don't believe in God. I guess the um, the uh, the block in this picture, you could think of that as a God's eye view of all of the past, present, and future potentially. But I mean, it's not something that I particularly would would. Yeah. Now, the current dominant view of uh, cosmological origin as we speak here in the year 2016 is the Big Bang Theory, that somewhere between 13.8 and 14 billion years ago, nothingness gave way uh, to everything uh, in some explosion, or that's not really what happened, an explosion, but what sure. we call an explosion, and that time was created along with the three large uh, scale uh, dimensions and possibly anywhere from almost a dozen to dozens of maybe tiny minor dimensions. Uh, it seems odd though that you might have dozens of spatial dimensions but only one temporal dimension. Is there any idea of if we accept the Big Bang as, as real, why there would only be one temporal versus many spatial dimensions? Right, I mean, this, is a, this is a really good question. So um, I, I should say these, these extra spatial dimensions you talk about, these small kind of curled up dimensions, this is something that comes through string theory. Yeah. Uh, this is one of the predictions that they make about the universe. And I, I guess there's no direct evidence for that. So I wouldn't say it's true that all theoretical physics is by these extra curled up dimensions. But right. it's certainly a big program in, in theoretical physics to explore these possibilities. Um, but yeah, why there's one direction of time in the block universe picture, that is a bit hard to understand because, you know, why not have two time and two space or, you know, it, it is, um, people have, I think, I mean, I don't, I'm not very familiar with literature. I, I believe some people have tried to make models which make sense of this, but I don't think they've got, um, it's certainly not a mainstream thing to think about. Um, and, and for me, this is one of the, in some ways, one of the flaws of the block universe picture. So I think a lot of these issues, there are some issues with, which look unnatural in the block universe picture but which look more natural from the old-fashioned evolving state picture. I mean, if what reality is is a spatial state that's evolving, there's really only room for sort of one sense of time. The sense of time is the sense that the thing is evolving in. Um, and, of course, you know, you could then build a box by layering the spatial states on top of one another, but the, the, going the reverse direction is less natural, as you say. If you start with a box, why not have two time directions and any number of space directions. Um, so I think uh, this is something that perhaps uh, is not completely well understood, but it, it somehow seemed more natural when we were in the old, this old, more old-fashioned business view of, of an evolving state. Um, in terms of the, the Big Bang, uh, you talked about that. I mean, of course, this is somehow talking about the bottom of the box somehow, like what it looks like right at the bottom. And, and, uh, and of course, it, there's a very deep question of, you know, why is there something rather than nothing why why did you know where did all this come from and and i i think physics has no particularly good answers to those questions um, well let's like let's talk uh, less about the origin let's talk about one mm -hmm. of the fundamental uh components of time as we know it and experience it and that's causality and before yeah. what what people often will ask when they ask talk about this is they'll talk about well why does the arrow of time go one way why do you eat an apple uh digest it and then defecate and urinate the remains from it rather than the reverse. But since we're talking about uh, time, time is experienced. We are sentient creatures, not philosophical zombies as we know it, or that, as we could prove it. So we have evolved to perceive things as we have for basic reasons of survival to presumably pass on our genes. And one of the things is that we per perceive causality. Why is it that when we talk about time, we either think of it either causally or reverse causally, as I said, uh, eating to defecation or defecation to eating. Yeah. Why couldn't we, for example, move a chess piece on a chessboard and defecate for no reason whatsoever? A causal things. What, what is it about time that is causal and why is there a direction one way or theoretically the other way rather than just randomly jumping about on the checkerboard of this block universe? Yeah, so I think this is really this is a really good uh, question and thing to talk about. There's actually several sort of intertwined issues here. But the first one is a sense of deterministic causality in the sense that we believe that if we know the current state of the universe um, now, we can use the laws of nature to predict it at any future time. And actually, we believe these laws go backwards as well as forwards. So if we knew the true state now, we could actually predict what it was in the past perfectly as well. We knew yeah. all that. I mean, uh, there's a limit to 
what we can know, but just for the moment, let's just say we didn't know the, the total state now. Um, so that's kind of determinism in some sense. And, and we can talk about whether quantum theory changes that or probabilities and how they enter the game, but that's a side issue for now. Let's say that there are laws which let you predict the future and the past from the present. Um, but, but that, um, and we believe that our current laws are kind of reversible, so uh, they say you can go both ways. But then there's the question of exactly why do we see why do we understand cause and effect flowing in one direction? And, and this, the, the main story is to do with entropy. So the idea is that, um, well, in general, sim simple things tend to, tend to evolve into more complicated things. Low entropy things tend to evolve into higher entropy things. And this is a very strong effect. And it's, it's actually still quite hard to make real formal sense of this. But the idea is that the beginning of the universe is this very low entropy state. Um, and that as you apply these evolution laws, it becomes increasingly complex, and that's and that is the sense in which we, we make these explanations. And the reason we don't, for instance, a good example is if you drop an egg and it cracks on the floor uh, and there's yolk everywhere, um, we see that happening quite often, but we never see the bits of egg, yeah. you know, get bashed by the floor. So when that happens, the heat went away to the floor. But we could imagine that all the vibrations in the floor kind of coalesce on the egg, bash the bits of eggshell back together, they sort of merge, the eggs leaps up off the floor into your hands. I mean, that never happens. And the reason is it would look kind of conspiratorial. You need very precise tuning of all the initial conditions to make. I mean, that, that, that process of the egg reforming and leaping off the floor is, is in principle possible. There's nothing that forbids that in the, law, in the laws of nature. But it just, it's just, a, you'd have to have a very, very precisely fine-tuned initial state to make all those things just hit each other exactly the right way to make it leap up. Whereas if you took an egg and you dropped it, or you dropped it from somewhere slightly different, or you dropped it in a wind or something, all the fun states would look roughly similar. So that's much more robust and less conspiratorial, that evolution. So that's the sense in which that's, we're more like to see things like that. Well, let me just that ask, was when you talk about low and high states of entropy, uh, I believe that's the second law of thermodynamics. And uh, wouldn't that require, though, that if things are getting more complex in the cosmos, that the cosmos must not be a closed system? Therefore, if the cosmos is not a closed system, then is time just uh, relative to the cosmos? Or does that beg for the multiverse or the omniverse, whatever you would call it, something greater, wherein energy is seeping within our cosmos to get these more complex things? Yeah, I mean, I, I, this is, a, again, a really good question. I mean, so there's how you formally define these things to make sense of what exactly entropy means. Um, again, it's, it's kind of complicated and it actually differs in classical and quantum physics how you see this. Um, but there's a sense, you're right, that if you, in some formal sense, if you have a universe and it's evolving by reversible laws, then it arguably doesn't get any more or less complex in at least one sense of um, reality. So if you start with a uh, a, a sort of complete state of complete knowledge and you evolve it by deterministic laws, you're, in some sense your entropy is always zero at that state, so in some sense it's not getting more complicated. But there's a structural sense uh, in which it's getting more complicated, and if you look at subsystems, although when you look at the whole thing, it, it sort of formally is, is the same complexity, individual subsystems within it become more complicated. Um, and in quantum theory this is because they become entangled with each other. Um, but Unpicking all these details is, is quite a subtle thing and, and formally, mathematically proving these things. And I should say this, the thermodynamics has sort of two different roles to play. So thermodynamics, um, as originally formulated, is really, uh, um, it really tells you rules about what you can do with engines. So how you can build engines to harness heat and turn, um, you know, turn work into heat and, and these kind of things. Um, but this sort of more philosophical sense of, you know, what is time? Does nature become more complicated? This second sense is, is sort of clearly connected to the, the first sense of thermodynamics and the second law in the context of normal thermodynamics, but it is much more subtle. And it has, um, I think, yeah, it's harder to formally um, make clear sort of statements. Well, uh, there, are, there are some people who would talk about uh, that... Uh, consciousness is somehow endemic into the cosmos. You know, the old tree, if a tree falls in a forest, does it make a sound? Clearly it does. But time is a more complex phenomenon than just sound, uh, sound waves emanating in some, uh, some uh, atmosphere or, or some medium. Um, is time possibly an emergent phenomenon that comes with consciousness, i.e. that 
when we look back and we you know hypothesize or theorize that the cosmos as we know it began about 14 billion years ago is if if there was no conscious beings or no sentient beings able to chronologically demarcate time does it exist i believe it does but some people have argued that it doesn't in in other words is is time some t- somehow epif- an epiphenomenon of consciousness yeah i i, I think I, I have seen arguments along those lines i think there is more to it than that. i mean it does seem to make sense to me to have a universe evolving with no people in it that does seem and there would be a sense of time in that universe um of course you know, there'd be no physicists to talk about it or, or uh, interviewers to interview about it. But um, it, uh, I, I think, I mean, I don't think it's just can be put down to kind of, it, I think you can imagine thinking there's just these random series of, of immediate states and somehow the process of ordering them into times is somehow your brain making sense of these things. I I mean, I, I've heard arguments along those lines, but I, I think there's more to it than that. So I, I would be, tend to believe that these, this notion of time is really connected to physical laws and not directly to consciousness. Although, of course, it we do experience time in, in our conscious perceptions. And um, uh, But I think that's not, for me, I don't find that compelling as the origin of time. I think that's just something we're experiencing, something that's happening in the physical laws. Yeah, and so your, your view, per, your personal view, uh, whether it's the dominant view or not, is that time, in a sense, is part of the material cosmos you are a materialist then i would assume and and time wh- whether we can explain it or not time seems to be something that is just there to be explored yeah i mean i i think um i think my preferred view is that is this view of kind of the, the state evolving in time and that that is what physics is about describing basically this time evolving state um uh, which is a bit different from many theoretical physics because I, I guess i'm uh, a bit more sceptical about this block universe picture as the fundamental picture of reality, although it, it has lots of advantages and it's definitely very useful to use. Um, uh, and I think one of the reasons is is because um, it, it doesn't, ex- exactly as we sort of touched on earlier, it, it doesn't seem to explain why we get all this causality. So in particular, this, this block universe has this very surprising property that you can just take one slice through this block, big box, and predict the whole rest of the contents of the box. And this... This seems a surprising property. Whereas, if you know reality is really an evolving state, then it's it's kind of obvious that you can evolve, you can predict the future from the past because you have the laws to do it. So, um, but yeah, I'm definitely a, a sort of taking a more material view. So, I, you know, reality is is a, a, a real thing, and and time is a real. It is, you know, you can understand it in different ways, but maybe you can understand it as the the process of this this state changing. That's is how I would look at it. Yeah, I've also heard people talk about. Uh the present, whatever that that continuously uh, moving thing is, sort of acts the way uh, a pasta machine would, in that you can you can take pasta made of wheat and semolina, and you can make noodles, you can make spaghetti, you can make vermicelli, you can make lasagna uh, pasta. Uh, you know, the dough comes in and it, it squeezes through and comes out in one form. So, in other words, uh, you have endless possibilities in the future. Here comes the present that bangs into the future and then the future is 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 made into a shape that it will put, or the it, the past now is that is forever shaped and and not able to be changed so that you can think of it almost like a sieve the present the sieve is straining the future into the past uh do you have any consonants with that kind of view do you think that the past then is forever uh you know cast in you know uh cosmological uh, iron or, or, or whatnot, and that the future is this doughy thing? <laughs> um, uh, I guess not really, though. No. I mean, I, 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 I don't think that the past... I mean, some people have this kind of picture of a growing block universe. This is one intermediate step you can have where between the sort of evolving state of the block universe, you can have that the, the, the block kind of grows and the past is therefore locked into this growing block. This is definitely a, a view that exists. Um, so that would fit with what you're saying, I think, that somehow the, the past gets locked into reality. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm not sure that I, I think I prefer to think of, I mean, I, my hunch is that it's more like the present that exists and the past did exist and the future will exist. But I, I guess 
this whole idea of formlessness coming into kind of concreteness. Um, I think I, I, I'm not so keen on that. I mean, I think there's a sense in which, you know, because I believe in this deterministic evolution of, of the universe, I think that the future is kind of not, uh, you know, is predictable from the present. So it's not. But it's not 100% um, predictable. There, there, are, there are general trends, you might say. But you couldn't say that in the year 25,278,383, some human being will hit a button and destroy the sun or something. You can't, couldn't do that. Yeah. I mean, but I mean, I guess that, I, I think of that as a, a practical limitation yeah. rather than in principle. I mean, uh, uh, and indeed, actually, probably in principle impossible for me within the universe to know that. But I do believe that if you knew, if, you took a kind of God's eye view and you knew the whole state of the universe, then you could in principle predict details like that, although it's obviously practically impossible. Um, I, I, yeah, but there is a difference obviously in terms of, you know, the ease of which we can, obviously in the past, we kind of made records of things that happened, so we can rely on our records and, yeah. and that's something that happened because we were using the evolution laws at the time and, and building these records and that is connected with this entropy. So. Um, you know, if you think of the, the universe as a big computer kind of following, uh, you know, evolving by some processor that's cranking the handle and evolving the state of the universe, then, you know, it could have bits of memory that, that record things that happened in the past, but until it's actually done the computation, it can't work out what the future is. So there is a sense in which the, computer, the future is harder to pre predict or compute because you have to really go through evolving all the state to get there. Uh, whereas the past, you've already been through that in the computation, so there can be bits of memory in the, in the universe which, which record what happened. So that, that is a difference. I mean, maybe, I don't know if this is a time to touch on uh, indeterminism and quantum theory. Or Yeah, go ahead. So, I mean, so uh, um, the way that quantum theory traditionally uh, talks about evolution is that it's indeterministic. So we usually learn that when you do a quantum measurement, you don't know what the answer will be with certainty, but you only get different probabilities for different things happening. And just, just so for someone to know, a quantum measurement would be, say, the speed of light uh, in uh, five... No, well, so it's more like taking very... Yeah, sorry. Um, so you're taking very small particles, for instance, yeah. and measuring their properties. So okay. if you took a single atom or a single electron, a little tiny particle of nature, and you, um, you generally find quant the way that quantum theory describes the state of these particles is not they have definite positions, and definite speeds, but more that their state is, can be kind of smeared out over lots of different positions. Um, and it's somehow intrinsically uns uncertain where that particle is. And when you, if you would say measure the position of that particle, the, the standard story would be that, you know, you would sometimes find it over here and sometimes find it over here, and, and there is that intrinsic uncertainty. So that's the, that's a kind of quantum idea. And essentially, whenever we do physics with tiny particle microscopic, well, even smaller than you can see in a microscope, but really tiny particles and fundamental particles of nature, they all obey these quantum laws. Um, but there is an alternative view of quantum theory and interpretation of quantum theory called the many worlds interpretation, where yeah. instead of this being indeterministic, you have instead the fact that the universe branches into parallel worlds in which each of the possibilities happen. So going back to my example of measuring this electron's position, I can imagine that I go up to measure it and then the whole universe kind of splits and uh, in one branch of the universe I see the electron over here, in another branch of the universe a copy of me sees the electron over here, etc. And these yeah. all kind of exist. And that, if you go down that line of, of many worlds, you recover a determinism. So you yeah. you don't have this indeterminism, thing, just that you have instead a multiverse type picture. Yeah, but now that was a very quick summary of yeah. Quantum. Now, but one of my objections, and I, uh, I've talked to a number of people in various aspects yeah. of physics about the multiverse, is well, if at every possible quantum choice to be made, whether with breaking it down into milliseconds, micro milliseconds, and across the whole spectrum of the cosmos, both on the quantum world, whether an electron goes this way or that way, or whether you ask out a girl for a date or don't, we'd be getting, with every second, quadrillions of universes. Where would, for me, where does all that energy come for to support all of the Tony Shorts that are going to be created in the next second, and all of the Dan Schneiders who are going to be asking him questions in the next second, and every particle in every particular cosmos? I mean, to me, that seems like just saying that the second law of thermodynamics doesn't exist whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, I can see 
but that that would be the kind of thing. So what what stop? This? I mean, of course, this is very strange to get your head around. Yeah. Um, the issue is that it's not directly a conflict with these things because you don't really add up the energy of all these worlds. So they, they kind of exist in parallel in the sense that the Tony Short in one world can never meet the Tony Short in another world. They're, they're really different versions of the same object. So in some sense, they they sort of share the same energy. They they don't um, you don't really ever add up their energies. So um, these are hypothetical just, Tony uh, Shorts. It's very like thinking about a property, a uh, yeah. sort of distribution of property of things that could happen, but they don't all kind of exist in the same space. Uh, I mean, on top of one another, they sort of exist in parallel. It's a hard thing to get around. Right. In some sense, these um, the possibility of these other worlds is built into the structure of quantum theory. So it, whenever I, when I talked about this electron being smeared over space, um, this is very much a fundamental thing that happens in quantum theory. And in some sense, all this many worlds think theory is doing is applying those basic principles all the way up to the larger structures like people and yeah. you know physical worlds. Um, so it, although it seems like this will generate immediate pathologies with the second law or with um, energy conservation, it, it somehow lives comfortably with those things because it is just really the same quantum theory you're doing with small particles, which works and just perfectly uh, good with energy conservation um, and these kind of things, uh, up to, um, uh, to to big people. So the, the energy of, um, I mean, if energy is conserved, the energy of each of these worlds will be the same, but you don't ever get to add them together. Yeah. So you had said that you're not a particular uh, devotee of the block universe theory, but some of the things you have described uh, about time and, and the future, someone might say, well, block-ish. Uh, so what would be your personal view of what time is? If it's not the block, what would you call it? And how does it differ? How does the Tony Short idea of the cosmos and time, what, what are the three or four major differences from the block universe? Yeah, I, mean, I, I guess, as I say, I, I kind of think, I think I, my intuition is the universe is more like a, a computer doing a computation, so that the, there is some current state in the computer, and the, the physical laws somehow are, are an update rule on that state, so you, you sort of run the physical laws, and the state kind of changes by doing simple local transformations on it itself, so they, the, the, there is a present moment uh, of all of you know, the reality, the universe, and there's some law which tells you what the state of the universe looks like at the next time step when it looks like this, this time step. And then you apply the laws again and you get the, the state of the universe at the next time. And, but the universe is really going through these these steps, just like the processor or the memory in your computer where it does a computation. Um, and only, you know, at some given time, only one of those states is in a rib. That's, that's how I, I think about it. I should say the big problem... I mean, the reason why this is this view isn't more widely held is because it, it has big problems with relativity. So one of the predictions of Einstein's relativity is that people don't agree on what the present is. So observers who are moving relative to each other will disagree about uh, what events happen in the present. So they, they have different notions of present. And my view of reality sort of picks out one preferred one as the real one. And this is a bit at odds with relativity. Um, I mean, it's not, it doesn't directly conflict because you, there could just be a, a preferred present, but what relativity would tell you is you'd never be able to find out who was right and which the actual present was. Um, so it's a bit uh, odd with at least the spirit of relativity. Well, whatever, um, yeah, whatever time is, and let's just, I mean, we could define it, I guess, in multiple ways. One of the ways that we measure time is by using other standards. For example, uh, we measure velocity with time, but you could measure time in terms of velocity. But then there you get into that circularity of definition thing that, uh, uh, but is that really a problem? Some people like, object to it, but I mean, if the universe or the multiverse even in a sense is a closed system, how could we not define anything by something else, you know, what is the color red? Well, red is is a color that is strained uh, because all the other colors on the known spectrum are you know are absorbed elsewhere, so we okay. only see the red. Uh, but then, what does that mean? So, do you think that the circularity of definition uh, in general is not a problem? Because some people do think that is, 
But I, to me, that's that's our ape-like linear thinking getting in the way of perceiving as it really is. If there are if things are totally interconnected, there's going to be a circularity in nature. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think that's exactly what I mean. The point is physical laws connect different properties. So if, because we have the speed of light as a constant of nature, as far as we can tell, um, distances and times are connected. So you can really define a meter as the, the, the distance that light could go, would go in a certain amount of time. And it, I, I do not believe that is how the meter is defined at the moment. Yeah. Um, so... And that just seems natural. If we've got all these connections between different properties given by the physical laws, we can use them to, to you know, define things in terms of other things. I think that's perfectly natural. But there are some mysteries. So, for instance, there is some uh, you can relate lots of different things. But at the end of the day, there are some characteristic length scales in nature. So, for instance, if you think about atoms, there is a characteristic scale which is the size of a hydrogen atom. Say that's that's something that just seems to come out of the laws of nature. But that, that does define a definite scale. Now, once you fix that scale, you can define all other lengths in terms of the number of hydrogen atoms you could fit in, a, in that length. But it's not completely scale invariant. So, you know, that it, it, if, you know if, because if, if nature is really continuous, if space is really continuous, then it's kind of surprising that there are preferred scales in nature for different types of objects. Um, and so that... Um, that I think is something. So the circularity doesn't go all the way. I think you do end up with, I think, basically one scale, which you can pick to be almost anything, but is essentially say say we could pick the size of a hydrogen atom would be uh, an example, or I mean you could pick many other things. But that, um, so I, it, you could imagine universes where there was no preferred scale at all, and that didn't have, and then you could you know build structures of whatever scale you wanted, and that doesn't seem to be our universe. Well, uh, we've talked now about what time is. Uh, let's pause here, and uh, in our next segment, I want to talk about some more of the bizarre or weirder ideas about time and various uh, things and uh, get your opinions on them. And we'll do that when we return. Talking about time with physicist Tony Short, uh, we have gotten to some definitions of what time is, a little bit of the history of the concepts of time. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the more bizarre uh, things that people have postulated over the centuries about time. But I want to start off with uh, one of the things you had said regarding uh, not being able to meet yourself in a, a multiple universe kind of scenario where, uh, where time uh, branches off so that the Tony Short, who is the physicist, might not meet the, the Tony Short, the potential cat burglar in another uh, universe. Um, <laughs> uh, that, of course, brings up the thing that most people associate with time from science fiction, which is time travel. Uh, going back in time, killing Hitler, or killing, uh, or saving Abraham Lincoln from not getting being, being killed, or somehow doing something that would send the Earth and the cosmos it's in in some other direction. Uh, is in principle, from what I've read, time travel isn't isn't verboten uh, in the sense that if we do live in a multiple universe, uh, the Tony Short, the physicist, might be able to go back in time, but you couldn't go back into your lineage, uh, your linear universe. You would have to go back into either the cat burglar Tony or the chef Tony or you know, the single bachelor Tony who's living uh, in Scotland or whatnot. So uh, is, is that the only way that you could possibly see time travel as happening? Because you couldn't go back in your universe and kill your grandmother, which would then obviate your existence. I mean, I think, yeah, that this is a, I mean, this is a very good question. I, I should say at the start, there's no direct evidence of any of these time travel type things, but certainly a lot of theories. So in... Um, general relativity, which is the extension of special relativity to, to sort of dynamical space-time and more complicated space-time structures. So this is the something that really fits very well with the block universe picture. You can imagine realities which have these loops in them, where you could imagine things going back in time and meeting themselves or meeting an earlier version. Yeah. And I guess in that context, um, which doesn't involve quantum physics, so it doesn't really have these multiverses, then you know, it really is this one of these time travel realities where you have consistent 
loops. So the fact is, uh, even if I was able to time travel here, I clearly didn't kill my grandmother because, you know, obviously I wouldn't have been born otherwise, or maybe the person I thought my, was my grandmother what was my grandmother really wasn't my grandmother, or, you know, so I think in that kind of context, you could imagine these things existing, um, but and somehow you end up with something self-consistent. So you don't end up with paradoxes, but you do end up with probably, I mean, it probably messes with uh, our ability to predict the future from the past, say, or, I mean, there, there are lots of things it does mess with in, in our ability to, to understand physics, but I think in that context, it would have to be sort of self-consistent in one universe. Um, then there have been people who've experimented with thinking about quantum physics with time travel, where, again, I say they use this smearing out of reality, these many parallel worlds, to kind of, as you say, in some sense, move back into a different world. Um, I, I don't, uh, I think these approaches are quite speculative. I mean, certainly you can make something work along those lines. These um, realities tend to have very strange abilities. So obviously being able to go back in time is pretty strange anyway. But um, I know there's some work that says that if you lived in one of these universes of time travel, you could do essentially arbitrarily powerful computation, as far as I can remember, uh, arbitrarily quickly. And the, the basic idea is you you kind of build a computer that, that can do pretty much anything, and then you just sort of make it run, and you say, well, if you don't give me the right answer to this hard problem, I'm going to shoot my grandmother and it sort of has to conspiratorially work out that it gives you the right answer, otherwise you cheat your grandmother and everything would be consistent. So it kind of, it, you know, you can make this more formal, but essentially you can leverage this time travel and the, the, the fact that everything has to not create paradoxes to do incredibly powerful computation for you, which is a rather bizarre kind of uh, consequence, but uh, perhaps it's bizarre anyway, so we shouldn't be too surprised. Well, we mentioned that uh, time... Uh a century or more ago by Einstein was firmly linked to space in space-time. Uh, and we talked about time being a temporal dimension versus the three known physical dimensions. Uh, one of the things that I've always found a little bit frustrating reading time travel fantasies, whether in fiction or whether it's been speculated by scientists as scientifically possible, is that, uh, you know, just in, say, the 40 minutes or so that we've been speaking here, uh, not only has time, 40 minutes, say, passed, but the Earth has rotated. The Earth has revolved hundreds, if not several thousand miles about the sun. The sun itself in the, sol has, in the solar system has carried and moved uh, X amount of miles, thousands, hundreds of thousands of miles within the galaxy. The galaxy has spun. The galaxy is getting closer to Andromeda. Our local group is turned. So even, even if we were if we could say just hit a button and go back 40 minutes to start this interview again, yeah, yeah, yeah. we would be somewhere out in the frozen waste of space, you and I. Um, and I, so I guess, yeah, you're definitely right. So, I mean, there must be something built into, you know, Marty replies with a real uh, uh, time machine to, to, to correct for the spatial location um, yeah. as well. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's definitely not something that's usually touched on in, in time travel movies. Right? If, when people go back in time, they go back to pretty much the same place. Yeah. But you're right, that, that in itself is, is not at all obvious. You should really be connecting space-time points with each other. So positions in space and time with other paths between there and, and other positions in space and time. Um, yeah, I, definitely is, is, a, is a worry. <laughs> it's, a, it's definitely not something that's been touched on in any science fiction films that I'm aware of. But um, yeah. maybe there will be one at some point and it'll be quite a boring film because I'll go back in time and end up just floating in space and they'll realise something's going wrong. But uh, yeah, no, it's, it's true. It is... Yeah, you can't you can't just move back to the same place in in a different time in, in a nap. As you say, if you just did it naively, you would end up in a completely different spatial location. Yeah. Now another thing too is though, even if let's say we couldn't physically act upon the past, would it possibly be theoretically possible? Let's say if future historians, uh, you know, there's a thing called cyber archaeology where now some people you know spend lots of time looking back at the early internet. But let's say if in three, four, five hundred, a thousand years or whatnot, uh, could it possi be possible that if we consider the past permanently fixed, that we may not be able to influence it, but somehow we could view it. We could send nanobots or something back to say, oh, uh, it really wasn't Oswald acting alone to kill JFK. It really wasn't... Uh, 
you know, we could solve a lot of these conspiracies. We could maybe just send things back that couldn't interact. I mean, is that something that's physically, uh, well, is that quantumly physically possible that we could somehow view the past and, you know, find out exactly what killed the dinosaurs or something, but we couldn't ever, you know, interfere with it. I mean, certainly, uh, uh, I mean, at the moment, this doesn't seem very likely to be to be possible. I mean, uh, or even, so, I mean, one of the things that I like about, just going back to the evolving state pictures of reality, is that this is clearly impossible that, in that picture of reality. Like there, because there is no box, there is no way to go back in time. Time. Yeah. You know, there is only a present that changes according to some rules, and the future is always predictable for the present. So this kind of thing can never happen. In the box, uh, I mean, you you might imagine that with some kind of strange cosmological phenomenon, you could warp space time enough that you could perhaps send some particles back, and maybe it would be easier to send back light, you know, or to to, to create a wormhole and some light from somewhere went down the wormhole. Uh, I mean, I I wouldn't like to speculate. I I think it's. I think it's very much in the realm of science fiction for myself. I don't think yeah. this will ever be possible, um, even in the far distant future. Uh, and, and actually, I think it's my personal hunch is it's in principle impossible. Yeah. So although some of our theories do seem to admit solutions that look like this, I, I believe it's not true of our universe. I believe in our universe there will never be time travel. Yeah. But, but it is definitely interesting to look at. Um, and you know, it's not it's not clear, but that will be my hunch. Well, let me get back Sad, to because it will be very interesting. Yeah, but well, I, let me. I, let me get back to the nature of time because, uh, you know, uh, the double slit experiment uh, seems to have shown that light can be either a particle or a wave. And some people have speculated, for example, that uh, gravity, too, has a similar dualistic property. I, When I was a boy, I watched Carl Sagan's Cosmo show, and he rolled this sort of uh, cue ball along sort of uh, uh, a bending uh, pool table to show that uh, uh, the pool ball could be the Earth going around the sun. But it's really it's it's uh, uh, revolution is really uh, a dip in space time drawn you know because the sun you know sags a little bit in space time and it goes around. But people have also said that there are things that gravity could be a wave, and they postulated a thing called a graviton. In a similar way to the way light definitely seems to be two things, and some people have postulated that gravity could be the warp of space time, or it could be a graviton. I've also heard time. People talk about something called a chronon, that time could somehow be somehow sliced into some kind of a fundamental particle. Uh, have you uh, ever heard of this chronon? What is the basis uh, for time as a particle? And how would that work uh, yeah, fundamentally or I'm, practically? I'm afraid. I, I mean, I, I think I've, I've come across the, the name, but I, I'm afraid I don't know that area of literature at all. I mean, certainly a bit of a strange... Um, um, the idea of Thomas Pascal, well, yeah, I don't know how you make sense of that. Uh, I mean, I guess if, um, yeah, I mean, I guess if you've got gravitons in it, so gravitons generally come out when you try and combine quantum theory and gravity. So if you try and think of a quantum theory of gravity, a natural way to try and do it is to think of gravitons just like we think of photons as the little particles that convey electromagnetism, radiation. Um, we can think of gravitons as little particles that convey gravity. The problem is that this theory become it, it has lots of pathologies and it hasn't been made to work. So people currently don't understand how to combine gravity and quantum theory. And indeed, the, the belief is that it might need to involve some quite more radical kind of steps, than just rather than just having gravitons. But um, but I guess gravity gravitons if they existed would would carry information about space and time. So in some sense they would carry some time-like information with them. So I don't know if, how chronons relate to that. I, mean, I just yeah. don't know anything about them. But um, it's certainly a bit strange. And, and it's definitely an active field of research to understand time and uh, indeed understand situations. So you can imagine quantum situations where um, you, you can imagine that maybe instead of this event always happening before this event, there are two parallel worlds in which one of in one world this event happened before event A happens before event B, and in another world, event B happens before event A, and now you have to understand that, what it means for reality to be spread over those two possibilities. And that sort of indefinite causal structure is an active area of research at the moment, and trying to understand how quantum theory talks to, to gravity, and it's connected, I think, to the things you say. So, yeah, these things are very hard to understand exactly what they'd be. Um, was there another, I, I think there was another question I've got, so... 
you no, that, 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 you answer that. Uh, let me just talk about relativistic uh, uh, appreciation of time because you know, as as you are there or I'm here sitting, uh, the soles of your feet are experiencing time slightly differently from uh, your buttocks. Uh, which is experiencing slightly different from your nose. So your nose is older than your buttocks and the sole of your feet, uh, just at his age and over the years that you've lived. You know, maybe it's only a, a tenth of a thousandth of a second or something. Uh, but uh, since gravity can affect time, uh, at least theoretically, and from what we uh, observed, even from space missions. Yeah, I mean, this has even been measured. So if, if you do, if you put cl clocks on satellites going around yeah. the Earth, they do tick, um, I believe, slower. Um, but they definitely are affected with um, by gravity. Yeah. So it, could there be something, though, that is outside this relativistic time, i.e. that there's an absolute quote-unquote super time in the cosmos or the multiverse or whatever, and that that is beyond the power of gravity? Because if gravity can affect time so much, what's to say that the electroweak force or, uh, you know, some other possible uh, energy or force, maybe what we ignorantly call dark energy, might not also affect time in, time in ways that we don't understand and that maybe some of the gaps in our knowledge are are really not because we don't know things, but but that there are things that actively can change over the course of trillions of years or billions of years of evolution. You know what I'm saying? That that time well is time consistent? Do we believe that time, say, you know, ten seconds after the Big Bang acts in the same way as it does now and it will act the same way in ten trillion years? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question again. I mean so we tend to think that our physical laws are what we say is time translation invariant. So at least in, in the, the normal models we have, so that they they don't depend explicitly on time. But people have looked at models where say some of the constants of nature change over time and, and it's things that people have thought about. Um, I think um, in terms of uh, the um, uh, what you, yeah, so in terms of this um, relativistic view of time and, and how it, it's all connected, I mean, you you could, if you wanted to have a more objective version of time, you could just say, look, so relativity really tells you how different people would would describe time in their reference frame. So you could imagine that there is some preferred reference frame which gives you the kind of true notion of time, and everyone else is somehow slightly diluted. So if you're moving relative to the preferred frame, your clocks will tick slightly differently, and you'll come up with some notion of time, which is a bit different from the true time, but, you know, everything will look consistent to you, but um, you could, if you wanted to, pick out that preferred frame. The, the, the difficulty is that um, this seems a kind of arbitrary choice. How do we know which one is the real one and who's deluded and who's not? So generally what relatively tells you is that everyone's view is equally valid and there is no preferred time, and, and that's why you end up back at this box that you can kind of carve up however you like and describe in from different perspectives. Um, but you could, if you if the world doesn't have these time loops in it, then I think it is consistent. There is some objective external time. Certainly, my view of this evolving state would would be would have some kind of external time that just sort of ran. Um, and I guess this effect of gravity, for me, would be more of an effect of, of gravity on clocks rather than on time itself. So mm. it would affect any possible build of a clock which would mean people's notion of time inside this world would look different, but there could still be an external time running things, potentially. So the idea that you read hypothetically that, it, let's say, if you could avoid, quote-unquote, spaghettification at, at the, the <laughs> rim of a, of a black hole, uh, the idea is that if you could maintain consciousness and see, all of eternity would, to you, seem to pass almost instantaneously, Whereas someone looking outside in the black hole would see you forever frozen at the rim of the, or the, the, the horizon of, uh, the vent horizon of the black hole. So, in, in other words, you, you would say that you think that there is some super time kind of thing that is beyond that relativistic thing of those two people at different parallax points in the universe. Yeah, I mean, I said, I'm not wedded to this belief. I mean, I, I could... Yeah. Uh, uh, but I, yeah, I, I guess I, I think 
uh, that I, I would rather explain this in terms of um, their perspectives and how they model the physics of the universe um, rather than having to give reality to all their views. If you try and give everybody's views reality, then you end up at this block, which, um, and then, you know, you, you potentially have problems with, uh, well, I mean, you have problems explaining why everything's causal potentially because you uh, you could have the possibility of closed loops and, and you have the possibility of other things. And I, I think there probably aren't closed loops and that everything is, is described in a simple way to someone in some perspective. And it's just hard for us in the, in the universe to understand what that true perspective is. But this is, this is an unusual view, I'd say. Like most people kind of buy the block um, and, and the kind of equivalence of different observers' perspectives. But it's, it's tricky to untangle. There's different things. There's how different observers would describe the universe and then there's what they actually see. So some of these effects are because they actually see light that's emitted from something a long time ago, but others are because they really are modeling the physics of the universe in different ways. And, and it's sometimes difficult to unpick those two things. So the effect you saw, you described about um, uh, seeing someone hover up, you know, never seeing them cross the horizon of a black hole, you will see them sort of fade away, but never cross the horizon. You can understand that in terms of light from them if then the light they emitted just before they crossed across the event horizon of the black hole so there's no escape from that point that light takes an incredibly long time to come out of the black hole and so you see that a long time in the future so you you keep seeing them longer and longer in the future fainter and fainter as they mm. call it but you never see them cross because you can't see them cross because after they've crossed light can't get out from there so you can't see that yeah. well let's let's get a uh... Let's get away from sort of physical effects of time and talk a little bit more philosophically. And uh, you can also opine more personally yourself. Um, I open this show with a, a sort of glib definition of time being uh, the thing that prevents everything from happening all at once. Um, is that, in a sense, really, though, a, uh, an answer that's spot on? Because why... Is there time then? I mean, yes, we can ask the ontological, existential question of why is there anything, a cosmos, why is there, uh, yeah. or, you know, uh, consciousness, etc. But uh, if if we take that opening quote as being glib, do you think that there's any fundamental reason why time exists? And I know that's outside the purview of science in a sense, why, but I'm asking you personally. Yeah, it's a... Um I guess the reason, I mean, this is just a, a sort of punch, is that what the, the world is very complicated. It has lots of, I mean, you know, me talking to you over Skype, that's a very complicated thing. And I find it hard to believe that these complicated things could just exist somehow, like the really complicated detailed structures that involve lots of things like that. Um, and it's sort of motivated in a similar way to kind of, I guess, evolutionary biology. I feel like if you're going to get something that's very detailed and structured, it's nice to have a sort of evolutionary story about how it got generated. I mean, okay, I'm not thinking about survival of physics here, but you, you have some story about a mechanism by which it emerged from something simple. And I think that's why I see time. I mean, I can imagine that all that had to sort of primitively exist was a simple initial state and a simple set of physical laws. So somehow the only thing that has to come from, that, from nowhere is this simple thing. And even on a computer, I can, I can write down a simple bit of code and a simple initial state, and I can run it for a long time and generate really detailed, complicated structures. There are lots of programs that do this. And I think, in some sense, that's why I think time has to exist. It's, it's a way of leveraging something simple to generate something with amazing structure and, and, mm -hmm. and interesting bits somehow. Uh, I feel like if you didn't have some mechanism like that, you'd end up with either things which just were simple and didn't have enough structure to have any rich consciousness or you know, interesting stuff, or we're just sort of totally random and again, didn't have the interesting structure that we observe. So I feel like time is useful for, for creating these interesting detailed patterns. Does that, does that yeah. sort of fill the... Yeah, so, but now now someone would probably respond to that and say that, you know, they would use the clockmaker argument as they do in evolution that, well, that's a time, the necessity of time, if we want to use a phrase like that, would tend to dictate that there had to be a planner behind it. And here again, we bring up a god or gods, uh, some artificer uh, and intentionality uh, in the cosmos that that 
uh, how could from total nothingness, assuming that that's what the Big Bang was, although I know that scientific nothingness still has potentiality, but from total nothingness, we could get not only physical properties, but uh, 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 emergent uh, temporal properties. Uh, someone would say that simply can't happen. Do you think that the emergence of the Big Bang or the, or uh, these physical and temporal properties is sort of akin to sort of uh, Darwin's idea of the blind hand of time or the you know the, the blind processes of evolution rather, uh, and, and that that these things can just that's just the way it rolled out because if it hadn't rolled out that way if the fine tuning of things in the cosmos. Some people have that anthropomorphic view that they argue right. that's why God is. But do you think that just a roll of the dice that if it had happened, uh, you know, 10 billion other ways, we wouldn't be here. It just so happened that this time, you know, every so often in, in existence, a, a universe is bound to happen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a tricky thing to answer. I mean, I, I, I'm quite, um, I mean, I think this idea that simple things kind of happen uh, you know, if it is e it's easier to postulate it's something, something sort of simple coming from nothing than something really detailed and complicated. And I guess, in some sense, this goes against the, the designer idea. Right? The idea is that, you know, you get something simple and then it, all, the, all the complicated structure you don't have to put in by hand. I mean, certainly if we just jumped in now and tried to explain the universe, it would look incredibly designed. But in fact, it seems like it could have emerged from some simple laws and a simple initial state. And things like us would have evolved. And it, it seems plausible to me that many... There are, there are many kind of rich dynamical laws which I think would generate complexity. And it's not clear to me that a lot of them would generate things like consciousness, conscious entities. I mean, you know, it, it's not, I mean, you, you want to have some kind of revert, some uh, evolution laws which, which can generate some kind of powerful behavior um, by, by simple rules. So sort of things that can generate complicated computations using simple primitive steps. But actually there's, I believe there's quite a lot of these things. So it isn't totally impossible there might exist other that a lot of universes where you start with something simple and start with some simple laws can generate these complicated structures and some of those structures will become conscious and start doing interviews. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I I think there's still you still got to get down to the question of, you know, why is there something rather nothing and why is there something with consciousness in it rather than something that's completely sterile and I think it's hard. To, I mean, it's hard to answer those things. I, I sort of sympathetic with this view that maybe there are many universes that kind of existed, and um, some of them support consciousness, and some of them don't. And we, of course, we happen to be in one that, that does the anthropic kind of um, view. Uh, but yeah, I don't see any particular need to have a, a kind of designer, like, or to tune the. I mean, people say that if the parameters were tuned slightly differently of the of the standard model of particle physics, then say we we wouldn't have stable well, Earths or, you know, stable planets with, with life on them. Um, I mean, that may be true. I don't know. I don't know the details of that. But it, it, it possibly, it, with some certainly tweaks to the laws, I could imagine that you would end up with some kind of structures which are complicated enough to be called life and which would be conscious in some way but would look so different to what we're used to that we would maybe not recognise them. I don't know how much these lines of argument rely on generating something that looks very like us or whether it really is about the richness of the dynamics. So for me... I'm kind of not convinced yet that that it isn't quite likely in some ways to generate something with some kind of complicated conscious structures in it after enough time yeah. with a sufficiently rich set of laws. Well, let me end and this. Probably look nothing like us. Let me end this uh, segment with uh, two questions I'm going to ask, and then we'll end the interview, and I'll give you a chance to wrap up any uh, thoughts. The first uh, question I wanted to ask is: I had mentioned the idea of consciousness, uh, and uh, probably the two the two competing ideas of what consciousness are, the materialistic view and the dualistic view. The materialistic meaning that that, that everything is as, as we think it is. Uh, there are, uh, whether it's made of string, strings or, or tiny, tiny, super tiny marbles of matter or whatnot, only the things that we can somehow measure scientifically exist. And then there's the idea that consciousness is and uh, 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 soulment, that there's something that we, some things that are beyond the can of science that we can't measure. Um, if, for example, we got to a point where consciousness, the mind-body problem, is never uh, resolved, say, in 500,000 years, and we just say it, 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 this is just something we have to accept, is it possible that 
when we get to if we get to a point where we can't resolve or actually pin down what time is, could time and consciousness are are there things that you think are possibly beyond the ken of human science or human understanding? Uh, yeah, really, I mean, good questions. I mean, I, I do find consciousness a hard one to, to understand what, um, uh, you know, what, what, why it, it feels like it does to, to be this kind of computer. I mean, I guess I tend to go on the materialistic side um, that, that, you know, there, there, there's my brain going on and somehow what it feels like to, to have a, a brain running that kind of compu computation is, is like being me. Um, having said that, I, I, I kind of... I want to pick up one thing you said, which is that if it was dualistic, if there was some kind of insolvent, this would be beyond the remit of science. I mean, I think this is probably, I, I would just disagree with this. If there is something that's a soul and it interacts with the physical world, then totally it's within the remit of science. Like, I, we would, I would expect to, to start up a branch of kind of soul physics and look at the interaction between souls and people and look at the possible states of souls. And, you know, like, we'd be, we'd be all over it. <laughs> well, I would, anyway. Uh, but, um, I, think it's, I mean, at the moment, there's no real evidence of that. But, you know, if, if, if if these things really exist and if they really have an impact in the world, then um, then I think they're within the remit of science. I mean, it, the only reason that they haven't is because of my science is that there's no direct evidence of, of this of them being necessary. That, that, you know, that, that it, that there doesn't seem to be any mysterious effects on the physical world that aren't explained by the forces we know about. Well, I mean, and, and this is getting a little off topic, but you you mm. couldn't you couldn't uh, uh, suppose then that let's say if there were alien uh, life forms and alien civilizations the, that they could perceive the cosmos uh, and reality in a totally different way and in ways that would maybe fill in the gaps of our knowledge. In other words, you know, is the human way of knowing the universe really the only way? Is the scientific method the only way? Or could there be theoretical ways that can get it? And maybe some of the things like we call dark energy, which is really just a term we use for our ignorance. Uh, <laughs> Could that actually be something that's very simple that some creature that evolved in a different way could say, what the hell are you talking about, you dumb apes? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, uh, it's hard to speculate on the, the powers of alien. Uh, I mean, certainly I think that we, I'm not completely giving up hope of, of understanding consciousness better. Uh, right. Yeah, I mean, we certainly, there's been a lot of advances in uh, kind of unsaying some aspects of it, at least in terms of, uh, you know, the neuroscience and stuff. Um, I, I do think it's, it, is, it does seem like a, a hard problem to know what the answer would even look like, or even what the, the right question is yeah. um, at the moment. But I mean, you know, it, it, it seems like in the future we'll start building artificial intelligences, and then, you know, this is going to become more pressing as a question, right? Are we going to think of these things as zombies, or are we going to think of them as as conscious? And I think that that will certainly bring it into their limelight. I mean, I think that inevitably will happen. Uh, I mean, if it hasn't already, it, it will happen. Uh, yeah. Things which, which seem like, you know. On a similar level to people, um, so that's interesting. Uh, but again, I guess that doesn't really necessarily answer the question, but it certainly yeah. could give us some insights. So you, um, you're, maybe, you're right. Maybe aliens. I mean, certainly, they're very plausible. There are aliens out there who have different perspectives, and maybe we'll just come to terms. I mean, I could believe that we also we just kind of come to terms with it in terms of a materialist kind of view, or we really find some evidence of something dualistic, and that'll be very exciting. Um, but so I. Yeah, I, I'm kind of skeptical, but so uh, you, I, so you're, I mean, you're, it's your belief then would be that that time is ultimately knowable. What time is? We may not know it now. We may only be five or ten percent of the way. But down the line, whether it's centuries or eons, that that we will know what time is, how it works. We may not be able to control yeah. it, but we will have a sense of it the way we do a basic sense of up, down, left, right, north, south. These things. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think so, and I think we'll get. I mean, I, I don't think we'll be able to sort of see into the future and the past necessarily yeah. in a natural way, but I think obviously we'll get better at predicting and retrodicting. We'll get better at predicting the future, and we'll get better at somehow retrodicting the past in some sense. Of, uh, um, but uh, yeah, I, I think we. I mean, I think there's still a lot about time to understand. And I think definitely within the remit of physics, I mean, understanding whether causality really holds, whether there are these time loops in reality, whether um, really relativity holds at the deepest levels, so or whether it starts getting broken at some scale, um, 
there are lots of interesting questions and, and lots of interesting research lines exploring all these topics and, and how to combine quantum theory and gravity because or oh, really how to combine quantum theory and sort of space time uh, really um i think this this is still these are still things which are being worked on and which progress is being made on and, and so i'm really confident that we'll make some progress on those things um so time i think is is more likely i mean maybe that i could believe we get to the point where there are unknowable things within the universe I, the things which our best physical models or our best philosophical models of reality include but which are somehow undetectable to us mm. within the universe that also seems possible yeah. but, that we sort of believe in them because they're they make the models simpler and more elegant yeah. but they are sort of provably undetectable by us what, um, we, what we would call just because reasons yeah no well i mean i think that these people sort of uh, there's a natural philosophical tendency to kind of not admit in your models or in your ontology things which you can't directly measure yeah. Uh, which is very reasonable because it stops you just inventing crazy stuff that no one can see. But I think if there was a really strong, if you if your model looked a lot more elegant and uh, you know, um, yeah, I mean, compact and, and powerful somehow with these objects in it, even if they weren't directly measurable, I think that'd be a good incentive to think of them as real. Like I, I I'm not. I think I'm more willing to believe the universe has simple laws than I am willing to believe that I, in the universe, can directly measure everything. That's yeah. true. All right, well, let's end there. Uh, when we return, yeah. we'll wrap up the interview, and we'll do that okay. in a moment. I spent an hour or more speaking with uh, Tony Short, a physicist, about time, what it is, what it could be, how it affects things. Uh, Tony, uh, let me just give you a sort of a, some closing remarks and just throw two things out. One, what is your uh, uh, ideas or your research uh, regarding time and quantum physics in the next few years going to be on? And wh what, where do you think that in your lifetime, the research about time will be going? Okay, good. Um, yeah, so in my research, I mean, one thing I haven't mentioned at all yet, so one of the strands of my research is I'm kind of exploring the possibility that time might be discrete. So instead of I mean, mostly when we think about space and time, we think of them as continuous things, so we can move smoothly in space and that time flows continuously. Um, one thing I've been looking at is whether we could maybe think of time as more of a tick, tick, tick of a, of a digital clock um, and space also as discrete, uh, actually. So like that there are sort of, there's a minimal kind of distance uh, that things could be apart. Um, so space is more like a lattice and think or a chessboard say and things are moving on that board and um time is really like in discrete steps um so this is interesting i mean so uh again this perhaps is flavored by by this sort of thinking of the universe as sort of a, a computer or but it, i mean it it somehow makes things more simple math mathematically um, to have everything discrete um uh, the one thing it does do is break a lot of these symmetries that, that happen in, in between space and time and between different directions in space and, and, and things like that. So uh, this is one thing I've been looking at a lot. And some initial research along these lines has shown that even though these models, um, they definitely aren't consistent at the, at the level of these small scale effects of time, space and time with, with relativity, you do still see that at large scales where, you, where you're much larger than the the sort of the, the minimum spacing between spatial points. Uh, so things are spread over much larger distances and time, the time scales you're interested in are really much larger than these tiny time scales. Um, it, it can look like the, the world is smooth and that indeed that things like relativity hold. So it could be that these, um, the things we think of as really absolute symmetries of nature, like rotational symmetry and relativistic symmetry, um, a la Einstein, are really sort of emergent things that happen at a large scale, but which aren't true at the microscopic level. Um, so that's one thing I'm, I'm interested in. Um, uh, I've been also thinking about these, how to understand time in quantum theory, and we talked a little bit about these uh, causal structures where there's a quantum, we'd say a quantum superposition of different time orderings of things. So understanding quantum theory where there's a, not a definite causal order, but things can have different causal orders, and, I mean, just exploring the possibilities really in a world where you interact quantum theory with, with um, time, space time in an interesting way. Um, and yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot of other research lines. I mean, I really hope one of the big things I hope will happen in my lifetime is, is really this coupling between 
quantum theory and so the moment and general relativity so we have currently our best theories of physics we have a quantum theory and we have a standard model of particle physics which explains pretty much we, we think it explains um pretty much everything except gravity although there's still lots of subtleties there which i'd like to understand better um and then there's gravity uh, which at the moment is a classical theory um doesn't uh, involve quantum theory at all which explains things like um uh, you know the, the big bang theory and uh uh, well, maybe that, that connects to, in some sense, alone, a very hand wavy sense at the moment, but, um, you know, planets and galaxies and these kind of things. So I'd like to see those two be merged into one theory of nature that can describe everything. Um, and so I, and I think that's realistic that that might happen in my career, which would be nice. Hopefully I'll, I'll contribute to it, but um, that would be good. Um, and yeah, I think just trying to understand this view of what time is and um, what what it means for it to be when, when you start to deviate from these things is, is kind of interesting. Well, anyone who's interested uh, in what Tony has said can find out more about him. I'll link to his page at the University of Bristol. And I just want to thank you for spending your time and talking about time itself. Oh, thank you very much. No, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your time. And, yeah, no, it's been lovely. Uh, thank you.